What about the other side of it when there's dysfunction? Take autism, which is a lack of, of social communication capacity. Uh, people may be just as intelligent, but somehow missing some of this ability to socially appreciate uh, group situations. Can imaging help us understand how that might work? I think it definitely has and can. It's uh, not a simple problem like stroke or Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease where there's a very clear, oh, here's something wrong. It's always in this part of the brain. Mm. So we don't have that situation. Much more difficult, much more subtle. Uh, and that's true of schizophrenia, autism, etc. There's no clear signal that says where the problem is. But in uh, explorations of normal brain function that really come from experiments done with electrophysiology by basic scientists, a system known as the mirror neuron system was revealed. And this is a network uh, involving many areas in the brain, the frontal and the parietal lobes, that have to do with monitoring behavior of others and therefore your own behavior and modeling behavior after others. So when you go like that, yeah. I want to go like that right. and vice versa. Now there are systems in the brain that suppress that so that we're not constantly doing <laughs> yeah, what Simon right. says. But in patients with certain lesions involving the mirror neuron system, the only symptom they have is to chronically repeat either activity that they see or words that they hear. So that's a, a disinhibition of the inhibition of this mirror neuron system, which is very helpful in how, having us socially interact. That's correct. Now, where would you see that in an image? Is it something that's localizable or is it... In it's in networks, again. When you have people do imitation tasks, etc., there are networks. So and you have a characteristic pattern. Correct. And when the, when the behavior has to do with some emotional component, mm. particularly of another person, you hit your finger with a hammer. So I relate to that. And the, in those cases, the mirror neuron system connects with the limbic system through the amygdala that we looked at uh, on scans. And you can then see that there are reactions between the mirror neuron system and the uh, limbic system, particularly the amygdala, um, indicating that this may be some pathway by which we actually feel, in an emotional sense, uh, the plight of someone else. Right? So, so someone's hurt, you feel bad. Someone's happy, you feel better. The biological basis of sympathy and empathy. Exactly. Now, people with autism have great difficulty with that. They don't easily grasp the social and uh, empathic state of other people. And so in experiments done here by a colleague of mine, Morella DiPretto, they saw when they showed faces to normal children versus children with autism, that if the face conveyed emotion, particularly fear or anxiety, those sorts of things, these two systems would be very active in the normal child. But in the autistic children, there was very much less activity in the limbic components when these mm. emotionally charged mm. faces were shown to them. So l autism, not a simple thing where you just say, it's oh, it's right there. But you can start to tease apart these much more complicated, subtle issues by doing experiments of that sort. So if you look at this grand overview and you see the tasks that are the normal tasks that can be done in, in our lives and some of the pathologies that occur and reflect back on what you see, what, what, is, what sense does it give you about the, this human feeling of consciousness and self-consciousness and the, the unity that we all seem to feel? Is that, is that an illusion? I think that is something where we don't have a good grounding in terms of many of these types of experiments. Uh, consciousness is something that most people take for granted, and some people spend their whole life trying to understand mm -hmm. or define. I think that it's kind of come of age now, that this is an important question, and what is consciousness, and who shares consciousness, and is it only uh, entities that have brains that have consciousness, or can machines become mm -hmm. 
conscious of their environment or aware of it. Um, I think it's an exciting issue. It's an interesting question. How would you get at that using imaging? That's a much harder problem. You know, I think if you go to the ends of the spectrum, we seem to be quite conscious and awake. We're yeah. interacting. We seem yeah. to have an idea of what's going on. Others may not think that, yeah. but versus a person who's in deep anesthesia, having an operation, where most people would say that person is not conscious by a wide range of definitions. One, one thought experiment that might approach this is to put a person in a scanner and take them from the state we're in now to the other state with drugs. Now that's one kind of trajectory toward unconsciousness. It may not reflect other issues, but that's one way of looking at this kind of thing. So at least you can find the biological correlates, whether correlation is causation is a whole other issue, but at least you're looking for correlation. Correct. At this stage of attentiveness, these functions were still active and drop that down in a very systematic way. And in that process, mm. what, what might be some of the results that you could get? A, a result that would give you deeper insight into the in nature of consciousness? Well, I think if you took a person from a normal waking conscious state and had them doing a battery of tasks that were quite comprehensive, and then you slowly dropped their level of awareness by increasing their sedation, you would see the relationship between what they could still do mm. and what areas of the brain remain active by the perspective we have with imaging today. So that would be one approach of trying to look at that. The other would be to take individuals who have altered consciousness for various reasons, uh, from trauma to lack of oxygen to the brain, to mental states that are different from what we deem normal, and try to characterize their behavioral repertoire versus what sites in the brain are still active. Now, that's a very concrete A equals B kind of thing. It doesn't play out perfectly across many of the philosophical and other questions about consciousness, but it does give you a certain repertoire versus systems available to run them. And it is scientifically demonstrable as opposed to perhaps other approaches which may uh, offer uh, uh, broad solutions but with a high degree of uncertainty. That's correct. You have actual data and you have both behavioral and physiological data in the same person at the same time. Uh, it would be ideal to do those kinds of experiments in collaboration with the more complex theoretical approaches because much of the work done with imaging is data-driven. There may be a hypothesis that if, if we ask a person to do A, we'll see X in the scan. But a, a broader theoretical uh, framework for doing this kind of work is something that lots of us are now trying to uh, stimulate and emphasize because that would bring a structure to the experiments that uh, would give them uh, an intellectual context in which to hang that result once it appears positive or negative.